Okay, so just like when we were studying cytokines, the various CD markers that we talk about in this course can really get confusing. Immunology, like I said earlier, can quickly become kind of an alphabet soup with all these cytokine abbreviations and CD markers and numbers, and um, it's really hard sometimes to keep it all straight. So just like I did with cytokines, I've made this video that kind of discusses the various CD markers that we're going to talk about during this course. And if you're watching this video early in the course, it probably doesn't make very much sense. If you watch it now, it'll kind of give you a little bit of an introduction to some of the markers we've already talked about and some of the markers we'll talk about later. Then watch it again as you're preparing for your summative exams and it'll make a lot more sense. By that point, all of the markers should fit together. Okay, so all of the CD markers have a common designation, which is the letters CD and then a number. CD stands for clusters of differentiation or markers of cellular differentiation. So markers of cellular differentiation makes the most sense, right? Literally, these are markers that we use, particularly on immune cells, that basically will tell us the different types of cells we're dealing with and maybe the stage in their development or differentiation, which makes perfect sense. Why they were ever called clusters of differentiation, nobody really knows, but that was their original meaning. We're just lucky that cellular and cluster start with the same letter because this one makes a lot more sense. So last I checked, there were about 400 CD markers or approaching 400 CD markers that are used. You do not need to know all 400 CD markers. You need to know about 25. And just like cytokines, it's easier if you try to remember them by what they do and the cell types that they commonly appear on, because then that'll also help you recognize the cells. So as you might have guessed, the CD markers of T cells are particularly important. For one, we have two distinct types of T cells, and they are named for their CD markers most often, and those would be your CD4 or T helper cells and your CD8 or cytotoxic T cells, sometimes shorthanded as TC. Most people will just say CD4 or CD8, so that's your first thing. Do you have a CD4 cell, which identifies the T helper cell, or do you have a CD8 cell, which identifies the cytotoxic T cell? All T cells in the body, if it is a T cell, will express CD3. So CD4 cells express CD3, CD8 cells express CD3, even the gamma delta T cells that nobody ever talks about express CD3. So CD3 is on everything that is considered a T cell. In fact, it is the marker of the T cell lineage. And remember that CD3 acts as basically the intracellular signaling machine along with CD4 and CD8 for the T cell receptor. So if you don't have CD3 and CD4 or CD3 and CD8, then you're not going to effectively transduce signals down to the nucleus, which will allow these cells to carry out their functions. And this is because both CD3 and CD4 or CD3 and CD8 bind to the MHC molecules. So remember, CD4 always binding to MHC class 2, CD8 always binding to MHC class 1, and both the TCR, the CD4, the CD8, the MHC class 2, and the MHC class 1 have various invariant regions that allow these bindings between these receptors to happen. So remember, CD4, that's your T helpers, CD8, your T cytotoxic T cells, CD3, all the T cells. Okay, now we're going to get to some markers that if you're looking early in the course, you haven't encountered yet. The first is CD28. CD28 is the second signal that a T cell needs to become activated. So there are two signals for activation, three signals for differentiation. The first signal we just talked about, it's basically TCR binding to MHC in the context of CD3 and a co-receptor, either CD4 or CD8. The second signal is CD28. CD28 is expressed on the T cell, and then it binds to one of the B7 molecules on the antigen presenting cell. When it binds to one of these B7 molecules, it basically provides that extra stimulation that the T cell needs to know that it should respond to the antigen that is being presented. 
If CD28 or the B7 molecule is not there, then the T cell only gets signal one. And if it doesn't have CD28, if it only gets signal one, the cell will move into energy. Basically, it won't be able to respond, okay? All right, so CD25. CD25 is the IL-2 receptor alpha chain. So we've talked about this a little bit, that a lot of our cytokines have multi-chain receptors, and IL-2 is no different. It has an alpha chain, a beta chain, and the common gamma chain, right? And the common gamma chain and the beta chain are almost always expressed on T cells. But the IL-2 receptor will really only show up once the T cell is activated, okay? Because this is the high affinity IL-2 receptor. This is, remember, that Thanksgiving feast that is really going to allow the T cell to proliferate in response to the antigenic stimulation, which is why it pretty much only shows up on activated T cells. The one caveat to this rule is the T regulatory cells. T regulatory cells constitutively express CD25. And the reason for this is because that means that they can constantly take up IL-2 from the surrounding area. A great way to stop T cells from responding to an antigen when you're ready to shut down an immune response, which is the main function of T regulatory cells, is to starve them. So if you're a T regulatory cell and you wanna stop all of the T cells in the area from responding to the antigen, you eat up all the food, they're starving, they can't proliferate, right? Okay. CD40 ligand, this is what allows B cells to class switch. So that should tell you something about the molecule CD40. CD40 is on B cells. So remember that the B cell receptor is an IgM molecule, and that IgM is always the first antibody produced by plasma cells upon their activation. However, T cells, especially CD4 T cells, are helper cells. So CD4 T cells will express this CD40 ligand, and then they can bind to a B cell that is presenting their antigen, because remember, B cells are antigen presenting cells as well. And the B cell will also express CD40. So when the T cell expressing its T cell receptor and CD40 meets up with the B cell that is also expressing its antigen to the T cell and has CD40 ligand, then that induces the B cell to class switch. So now, instead of producing IgM, based on the cytokines that the CD4 is producing, it might produce either IgG or IgA or IgE or whatever is required based on the cytokines that are being produced by the CD4 T cell. So CD40 ligand allows for CD40 ligation, which allows for class switching. And the ligand is expressed by T cells, particularly the T helper cells. Now, think about that. Remember that there are patients who lack either CD40 or CD40 ligand, and those patients have a disorder known as hyper-IgM. Hyper-IgM literally just means that they can only produce IgM. They can't class switch because they don't have this signal for CD40 and CD40 ligand. All right, moving on, memory cells. Memory cells have a particular signature, and that's CD45RO. This is an isoform of the CD45 molecule. It's really the only isoform of CD45 that I expect you to be able to recall. And really, it is upregulated on memory T cells, basically a T cell that has been selected to survive after the antigenic threat is gone and the majority of the T cell pool has died off to create just the smaller pool of memory T cells so that we're prepared to fight the antigen should we encounter it again. All right, so an important part of creating that memory pool is basically killing off all of the cells that we don't need anymore because we can't have antigen responses last forever. Once the antigen is gone, we really need to shut that down because inflammation can be damaging. So how do we do that? Well, we do that with inhibitory receptors. And one of those inhibitory receptors is CTLA-4. So CTLA-4 is an inhibitory receptor that is expressed on T cells that works to end the immune response once the threat is gone. And it does this by inducing energy. So basically what it does is it takes the place of CD28 binding to B7 molecules. And the reason for this is that CTLA-4, remember, binds B7 with basically 100 times the strength that CD28 binds B7. So 
if we think of it that basically CTLA-4 is going to outcompete CD28 for B7 molecules. And as the antigenic burden gets lower and lower and lower, there will be less B7 molecules available, which means the higher affinity CTLA-4 molecule will win out, T cells will become anergic and eventually without stimulation die off. And that's a way we can kind of contract that pool of T cells to create a nice homeostatic environment. PD-1 does a similar thing, but instead of inducing energy, it induces a process known as exhaustion. This literally means that the cell is too tired, it's too wrung out to continue producing cytokines, continue um, producing an immune response. We see exhaustion more com most commonly in um, chronic viral infections, cancer, some autoimmune diseases, and basically it just means that the T cell is done. All right, so if PD-1 is ligated by its ligand, PD-1L, on antigen-presenting cells, it basically tells the T cell, you're tired, stop fighting. And most notably, we think about this with CD8 T cells, because as I, remember, as I mentioned, we most commonly associate this with chronic viral infections and with tumor cells. All right, the last one is fast ligand. And this is actually expressed much like CTLA-4 to end the immune response. And what it does is it induces apoptosis when it binds to FAS on other cells. And it's one of the main mechanisms that cytotoxic T cells can use to kill cells. So it can be used to end the immune response, but it can also be an effector cell response for CD8 positive T cells. Okay, so let's move on to B cells. B cells are a little bit easier to kind of comprehend. For one, there's a lot less markers. You have three main markers, just like you do in T cells, except in this time, they all identify B cells. There's no CD4, CD8, just these are your markers for B cells. CD19, CD20, CD21. All of them identify B cells. CD19 and CD20, we don't really currently know exactly what their function is. It's possible that CD20 is actually a calcium ion transporter, but we do know that they seem to have a potential role in the activation of B cells. How isn't really clear, but we know that they're present on B cells and therefore can be used to identify B cells. A little note for CD20, CD20 is actually a target for many current immunosuppressive therapies, um, specifically many of the biologics that you see advertised on your TV right now and that you'll learn about in your pharmacology studies are actually anti-CD20 monoclonal antibodies, and they target the human CD20 marker for basically the ability to destroy B cells or inhibit their activity, which can be linked to many different pathologies in both cancer and autoimmune disease. CD21 actually does have a known role. It's the C3D complement receptor, which as you can mention, it probably imagine has something to do with complement activation. And because of that, it also can have a role in B cell activation. CD40 we already kind of talked about on the T cell slide. So basically, B cells express CD40, and when it is ligated by CD40 ligand on the T cell, it induces class switching so that the B cell can go from being an IgM producing plasma cell to maybe an IgG, IgA, IgE, um, and that will allow it to produce different types of antibodies that are specific for the type of immune response that it's trying to make. B71 and B72 are also known as CD80 and CD86. Remember, immunologists are mean and we like to name things two times to keep things confusing. But basically, B71, B72 are two molecules that can bind to either CD28 for T cell activation, providing that signal too, or when it's time to end the immune response, they'll bind with higher affinity to CTLA-4 on the T cell, which will allow it to stop the immune response, okay? So when it binds to CD28, we're activating the T cell. When it binds to CTLA-4, we're stopping the T cell. Okay, so last, let's deal with all of the other cells of the immune response. Um, I'm talking about your monocyte macrophage populations, your NKs, your dendritic cells, all the other cells that are not T cells and B cells that we commonly deal with as we talk about the immune response. There are many more markers that these cells express, but these are kind of the ones that I would expect you to be able to pick up on. And many of them we've already talked about if you're watching this early in the course. So this is kind of a good review of what we went over when we were talking about innate immune, immunology, okay? So 
monocyte macrophages, remember monocytes exist in the blood and macrophages are tissue resident, right? So wherever they develop, that's where they're going to remain. They can't move around freely like their monocyte friends, okay? Remember that they have pattern recognition receptors and these pattern recognition receptors enable them to kind of identify things that are dangerous or that the body has learned they need to elicit a response to immediately. And those things are called PAMPs, right? Pathogen associated molecular products. And the PAMPs will basically signal the PRR to know that it needs to make its response. And one of those PAMPs that we talked about a lot was LPS. LPS is produced in the cell membrane of many bacterial infections, so our body already knows it's a bad guy. So CD14 binds very carefully to LPS and then signals to the monocyte macrophage, hey, I got something here, let's start making an immune response. CD11B is also a marker on monocytes and macrophages. It's also present on NK cells, right, which are a lymphocyte that can act as part of the innate immune response. CD11B is the C3B complement receptor. And remember, C3B is one of the most important components of complement because it's huge for opsonization. So when C3B binds to our microbe over here, so here's a little microbe, C3B is binding all over it. It basically makes it easier for a macrophage to come along and eat it. So basically it does that because CD11B is going to bind directly to the C3B and that's going to make it a lot easier for this macrophage to just come up and gobble it up. All right, CD16. This is the FC gamma receptor three, okay? So let's remember our IgG antibody shape, okay? So I'm gonna draw a little IgG here. Here's your heavy chains, here's your light chains, okay? And up here is your fab fragment, right? Fragment of antigen binding. And down here is your constant region, your FC, okay? So F C gamma R3 basically means that this is a receptor for the FC portion of IgG or immunoglobulin gamma. So this is one of several receptors and particularly this is number three in the line of FC gamma receptors. So FC gamma three basically is going to be able to bind the FC portion of an antibody which allows it to opsonize whatever the antibody is attached to. So let's make this our little microbe in here, right? So the antibody is attached to that the, micro, the macrophage or monocyte or dendritic cell over here has an FC receptor for the FC gamma portion, and that's going to allow it to opsonize, which is really great. So this is going to be present on your macrophages, your NK cells, and your neutrophils, which are all going to be able to gobble up that pathogen and eat it. B71, B72, we already kind of talked about. Remember, they're also known as CD80, CD86. Generally, they provide signal 2 for T cell because it ligates the CD28 on the T cell. They can also bind to CTLA4 to stop the immune response. And these are basically then going to be on antigen presenting cells, right? So monocyte, macrophages, dendritic cells, really important here because dendritic cells, remember, are the ones that as they mature are going to move to that draining lymph node and generally provide that pre, like that initial introduction to the T cells to recruit them into the adaptive immune response. So they're going to provide that priming phase. So they need to have good B71, B72, CD80, CD86 expression, okay? CD56 is an adhesion molecule, and it's largely used as an identifier for your NK cells. And within that, you're going to have a couple different um, levels of expression, CD56 high, CD56 low. But basically, if it's expressing CD56, it's a pretty good bet that it's an NK cell, okay? And then fast ligand. I talked about this with the T cells. It's also true of NK cells. NK cells use it to kill infected cells or tumorigenic cells. And basically, it'll induce apoptosis in any cell that it's expressing fast. So fast, fast ligand is a little tricky, right? Because the cell that is killing expresses the ligand. So literally, cells have to volunteer to die. So something is going on in that cell that makes it say, you know what, we are a sinking ship and we need to we need to be like a sacrificial lamb here. We need to be the hero and go down to save our, you know, friends that are surrounding us, the other cells. So since something is going so wrong, we're going to upregulate this receptor fast. 
and FAS, when bound by its ligand, FAS ligand, will immediately induce apoptosis in that cell. Okay, so those are all the CD molecules that you should probably be familiar with throughout the course. If you're watching this video early, that's great. You now have an introduction to a couple of different major concepts in immunology. If you're watching it later in the course, hopefully everything now makes a lot of sense. And if it doesn't, let us know.